Now Newsnight on BBC Two with Gavin Esler. Tonight, United Nations organizations promise a full investigation of recent killings in Syria and point the finger at the Assad regime. Has he committed war crimes? We ask ourselves why we, we didn't hurt any one of them. Why you kill with him? As every day brings further atrocities, is Britain correct to suggest Syria is on the brink of civil war? We speak to the UN's Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, along with Paul Wolfowitz and a friend of the Syrian government. The old financial wisdom is that if there's a queue at a bank, join it. It's happening in Spain, where the money is pouring out. Is the EU ready for another major crisis? And in London, the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei's latest work, under constant surveillance at home, we have an exclusive interview with the man regarded as one of the Chinese government's leading critics. I like to come to London uh, to be able to see it. But of course, uh, my current condition is not allowing me to travel. Good evening. The United Nations top human rights body has condemned the Assad regime in Syria for the massacre of more than 100 civilians last week in Hula. 49 of the victims were children under 10. The UN is also suggesting Syria may be guilty of war crimes and wants an independent, prompt investigation. But of course, the real power at the UN lies with the Security Council, where Russia seems determined to stand by its increasingly discredited ally. Following a week of atrocities, activists today claimed that Syrian government forces executed 12 civilians on their way home from work. First tonight, Tim Huell reports. Three massacres in one week. 12 men killed in Boueda Sharkia yesterday, 13 corpses discovered near Deir Ezzor on Tuesday, at least 108 people, including 49 children, shot or stabbed in Hula last Friday. Are these deaths the tipping point for the outside world to intervene in Syria? The latest grisly video posted online by opposition activists show what they say are the bodies of 11 workers from a fertilizer plant and their driver forced off a bus and killed by pro-regime militia. They stopped by checkpoint. Shabiha, it's basically a group belong to governments and paid by government, probably professional killer. That can't be verified, but the role of the Shabiha militia in the two previous atrocities has effectively been corroborated by UN observers. It all points, many believe, to an ever more deadly sectarian divide. <laughs> The exact makeup of Syria's population isn't known, but very roughly, 70% are Sunni Muslim Arabs, 12% Alawites, an offshoot of Shiism, 9 or 10% are Kurds, mainly Sunni, at least 6 or 7% Christian, and about 2% Druze. Earlier this year, Christian leaders in Damascus told Newsnight they were worried about where the uprising might lead. But it's Alawites, like these in Homs, who as a community have gained most from the rule of the Assad family, themselves Alawites, and now have most to lose. The Syrian regime and also the revolutionaries inside in Syria don't really want to uh, shed a lot of light on the sectarian dimension uh, to the ongoing conflict. Of course, the regime uh, would like to wrap itself in the Syrian national flag and it doesn't want to expose the sectarian dimension of the regime. At the same time, the revolutionaries don't want the world to perceive the Syrian revolution as one between Sunnis versus Alawis. Uh, but the reality on the ground uh, suggests otherwise. The massacre in Hula, a Sunni pro-opposition district, is blamed by locals on killers from neighboring Alawite villages. They call them Shabiha, which means ghosts, the term for thugs paid by the regime. Most Shabiha are Alawite. But it's not really clear in Hula whether the perpetrators were Shabiha or not. They're identified primarily by their religion. We know them by accent, as I said, you know, because they, uh, most of them is, is, is they Alawi, from Alawi. But these people you call Shabiha, government thugs, aren't they simply ordinary villagers, neighbours of yours? Yes, yes. 
Yes, we, we are neighbors from hundred years. We we ask ourselves why we why we live together. We, we we didn't hurt any one of them. Why why you why you stand like that with the with this regime? Why you kill with him? I find it very hard to believe that someone would accept payment to go and kill uh, women and children. Uh, people sometimes get payment to fight, and that's normal. But to kill women and children, I think that reflects a deep-seated hatred uh, for the for the uh, rival community, uh, and it reminds us of uh, what happened in Bosnia and also what happened in Rwanda. Um, th there is a there is a very deep hatreds within Syrian society that have been paper, papered over for very long. Their responsibility. Today, the United Nations Human Rights Council condemned Syria for the massacre though Syria itself blames anti-government terrorists. It's now a familiar pattern for armed terrorist gangs to carry out massacres immediately before UN Security Council meetings or a visit to Damascus by the UN Special Envoy precisely to lead to special sessions hostile to Syria like this one today. But the UN has found no effective way of putting pressure on the Assad regime, despite its warnings of civil war. Outside observers have been predicting civil war in Syria for the best part of a year already. But it's still an unequal struggle that doesn't quite justify that term. The opposition controls no major stretch of territory, it's vastly outgunned by government forces, and its leadership is riven by political division, while the regime remains remarkably united. The best weapon we have is RBJ, you know, made by Russia. This, this again, used against tanks. What we have uh, from Free Army and their weapons, uh, it's just for defend or defense uh, our families. The danger is not even just the civil war within Syria, but then you have to look at who's arming the opposition, where is the money coming from, and is it likely that a war in Syria will spill over and become a regional uh, conflict? This week's killings can only fuel a cycle of revenge, but it may prove not a tipping point but just part of the slow descent into chaos. Tim Hyo, in New York, we have Ivan Simonovich, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. From Washington, we're joined by the former US Deputy Defense Secretary, Paul Wolfowitz. And here in London, we have the Syrian businessman, Amar Wakaf, who's in favor of regime reform, but not regime change. Um, Mr. Simonovich, are you absolutely clear that the Syrian government is, in some cases, deliberately organizing the killing of civilians? Uh, I am now not referring to this latest incident. For this latest incident, uh, the uh, available data are pointing out to the responsibility of the pro-regime forces. It uh, concerns uh, the use of uh, heavy artillery, but also uh, to the alleged activity of Shabiha militia. However, this still has to be confirmed through investigation. But on previous cases, uh, it has been established beyond any doubt that there were widespread uh, violations, grave violations of human rights that may amount to crimes against humanity. That may amount to crimes against humanity conducted by the regime? Uh, by uh, various uh, people acting on behalf of the regime. Uh, the crimes of humanity always have their individual perpetrators. Right. So, but if you believe that there are uh, war criminals or potential war criminals, realistically, what can you do, given that it would take a reference to the uh, International Criminal Court and given what we know about Russia not wanting to do that, they are in a pivotal position in the Security Council? In other words, nothing's going to happen. Well, we did, as Office of Human Rights, encourage Security Council to refer uh, the situation in Syria to the ICC. 
And uh, if I may remind you that today's resolution of the Human Rights Council recollects uh, the invitation of uh, the High Commissioner to refer the case to the International Criminal Court. I don't think anybody is doubting your good faith in this, but when do you actually expect anything to happen given the position of Russia which it can use its veto? Russia definitely has a high leverage in Syria. What is important is that this leverage is uh, put uh, uh, to uh, the right way uh, to positively impact the developments. I think that uh, the votes that were supporting the resolution of Human Rights Council uh, resolution today are quite indicative. Uh, there were 41 votes for the resolution, just three against and two abstentions. Yeah, and, but uh, look, those massacres have been carried out while the Kofi Annan peace plan is supposed to be in operation. You can understand the world's frustration that the UN, full of good intentions, can't do it. Uh, I'm sharing completely that frustration. Uh, a result of such a frustration is also the uh, forthcoming initiative on uh, the General Assembly briefing on the situation in Syria. Okay, let me bring in Paul Wolfowitz, who's uh, joining us from Washington. Mr. Wolfowitz, what concrete measures do you think the US could do, if there was a political will to do it, that would improve the situation, and would the Allies follow? Well, let me just first say there's a depressing repetition of history here. Um, Someone said, and someone in fact was Kofi Annan a few years back, in their greatest hour of need, the world failed the people of Rwanda. The United Nations could not muster the will to confront the evil. A bit later, he said about the massacre in Srebrenica, that it will forever haunt the history of the United Nations. We have another one of these charades going on, behind which the international community does nothing, while people are slaughtered. And the recent massacre was terrible, but put it in the context of 10,000 at a conservative estimate people killed since all of this began. It's time to say that this regime is serious only about killing its people and until the world gets serious about helping the opposition to organize, the killing isn't going to stop. The key is to stop the killing, but that will happen when Assad's killers decide that their future doesn't lie with Assad but lies with a new Syria. Mr. Mokaf, um, reform of this regime is not going to be possible, is it? The world basically wants rid of Assad. Yes, well, that's the problem we're having. The world is very much preoccupied with the removal of President Assad, is not looking really at the prosperity of the Syrian people. But the prosperity of the Syrian people would be improved significantly if Mr. Assad was not encouraging them to be murdered by his own people. Well, the point of the matter is that the international community is getting the information sometimes wrong. So regarding this latest Hula massacre, we are now, we now understand, because we know the names of the people who were killed, that the two families who were uh, targeted and slain in cold blood, basically, are pro-government families. One of them is the extended family of a newly elected MP of the region. But as you well know, it's a pattern of behaviour of this, not just this regime, actually. His father is a family tradition of the Assads to murder people who get in their way. Thousands were killed by Hafez al-Assad in 1982 in Homa. So uh, why, uh, why would anybody believe other than heavy weapons are being used against civilians and that the Assad regime is encouraging people to kill children. Well, basically, because the fact that the two families are pro-government tells you that it wasn't the government. Well, how people. come the, the UN's got this completely wrong? They've been on I the ground, and you're sitting in London with me. No, no, no. It's just the the. It's basically the extended family of the newly elected MP. Those families did not participate in the anti-government uh, protests. They did not fund the rebels and so on and so forth. So somebody decided to kill them. Uh, Mr. Wolfowitz, uh, given all this, and also given the sectarian makeup of the country. Do you worry that any intervention of any sort by outsiders, including arming the opposition, could further destabilize things and lead to sectarian warfare? Look, you have sectarian warfare right now. You have a civil war right now. But as one of your speakers said earlier, it's a civil war where only one side is armed. Look, there are very bad outcomes that can come out of all of this. But the longer the bloodshed goes on, the worse the outcome is going to be, and the more those people who are interested in a less sectarian Syria, in a more tolerant Syria, sit on their hands and do nothing, the field is going to be left to extremists, 
from outside the area coming in to radicalize the situation and of course extremists within the regime. There's no magic solution here, but I think it would be a better outcome if the international community, and there are many others besides the United States who I think are ready to step in, notably Turkey and Saudi Arabia, would come together not only to strengthen the opposition, which is essential, but also to get them to commit to a subsequent regime that would protect minorities, protect the Christian right. community, even protect but, the Alawites. But, but it, it, you That's said that, to, uh, uh, as you rightly said, stopping the killing uh, undoubtedly should be the first priority. And in order to do that, would that take some kind of military activity, uh, safe havens, and perhaps the use of force? And that, presumably, is what puts the Obama administration off contemplating it. Well, you know, the Bush administration in, in 1992 was off contemplating arming the Bosnians, so that conflict went on for three bloody years, and it sat on its hands while Saddam slaughtered the Shia. And as a result, we had Saddam in power for another dozen years. Inaction may seem like the easier course, but in the end, you pay a very high price for it. Uh, Mr. Simonovich, I'm not, I don't think, by the way, to be clear about this, I think creating conditions where the Syrian army can abandon Assad is really should be the objective. Right. But, Mr. Simonovich, uh, do you worry that perhaps uh, the UN people in Syria have got it wrong and that, in fact, some of these massacres are not being carried out by uh, people paid for or uh, supporting the regime but are a result of other kinds of feuds? We got uh, not verbal from uh, Syrian government uh, saying that they have proofs uh, that uh, El uh, Hule massacre has been committed uh, by the terrorists. But if this is so, why not letting International Commission of Inquiry, which has been established by uh, the Human Rights Council in, and establishing facts beyond any doubt? So I think this is an open invitation to the government if they really believe uh, uh, that the truth should be established to enable international organs uh, qualified to do so to be active uh, in this way. Mr. Now, Simino, just, sorry, just, uh, just, I was just yeah. going to ask, we're running out of time. I just wondered if you fear, listening to Mr. Wolfowitz there, that we might see another Srebrenica, another Rwanda, people wanting to do things but not able to do it. What I believe very strongly is that there must be a clear perspective for Syria for various ethnic groups and that their human rights must be guaranteed. There must be a power-sharing arrangement with the ethnic and religious representation in such an arrangement. Uh, I think that the problem of Syria at the moment is that many people feel insecure and this is the reason why we do not uh, uh, succeed in implementing the ceasefire okay. and other things envisaged we'll to, in the announcement. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Now, it was worse than expected U.S. job figures that sent markets tumbling today, but America's unemployment level would be the envy of some Eurozone countries, in particular Spain, where a quarter of the population is now out of work.